Uh, welcome to Async. Tonight we have Tom Ashworth here from Twitter talking about service worker, maybe to replace app cache in offline apps. Okay, welcome to Tom. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, service worker offline web. This is not something um, I've got in production. This is not something you, uh, you can put in production right now. Um, but I think it's something we uh, should all be thinking about, talking about, and working on because I think it's something really, really exciting that's just around the corner. And um, I feel really strongly that this, this is something we should um, we should really make happen in a really good way. So. Uh, th that's the caveat for this this talk. There's, so it's really experimental. It's really early days, but um, the idea is I just want to um, get everyone talking about it. Um, really. So uh, offline, wh where are we now? What are your options if you want to? If you're working on the web and you want to, um, you're out to work offline. Uh, you want some offline features. And are there a couple of examples out there? Well. We know about um, the app cache, and let's go on to the other alternative if you want to do something offline as you go native. Um, there have been, have been some examples of people who've done really good stuff with offline um, uh, on the web. Um, this site, which uh, chap in the middle of the room uh, was instrumental in building, um, uh, uses the app cache uh, and uh, related um, technologies. And it, it's kind of spawned this whole discussion. This, um, Sort of, as far as I can tell, because um, Jake gave the uh, wrote the App Cache douchebag article, which spawned talks and got people talking about the fact that App Cache really was not the right solution for um, for the, the offline problem on the web. Um, and so I, I'm really um, you know, grateful for, uh, to Jake actually for uh, talking about this stuff and, and writing about it because it's it is something I think is really important. Uh, another example is um, this one that I've just come across uh, recently, um, DevDocs, which and you may, you may know um, Dash is another thing, but like it, it's um, uh, searchable documentation for loads of different projects. So um, the search bar in the, in the top left lets you uh, quickly jump to, uh, or just you know basically fuzzy match across a whole stack of documentation. You get to choose which uh, docs you want. So they've got Node and Angular and Backbone and all these kind of things, and they they um, they've scraped <coughs> NDN and all, all these kind of places. So I think this is from uh, possibly some NDN documentation on on them. Um, on background clip. Um, now they sort of claim that they work offline and it does use app cache and it um, does a couple of other things but actually if you're offline uh, what you get is this. Um, I th as far as I, I haven't quite figured out exactly what it does give me offline. I think it gives me the, um, the search so I can do a search, I can look through the documentation, find the thing I want to know about, think great, yay I get to learn about it even though I'm offline and then I click it and it does this. Um, which is kind of depressing. Um, so the, the other, some other things they're doing, they're, they're caching the search um, uh, as a, in local storage, which is one of the things you have to use to complement um, app cache. But uh, all this is is just the headings of each of the pages. It's not really um, anything useful. But this hints at one of the problems that we have um, offline, which is the space constraint. Um, certainly on, on mobile, we've, very limited in what we can do in terms of saving to, to local storage um, and, uh, and even, even index DB. And um, the story for say, um, saving binary data and videos and uh, things like that is not good, uh, not good either. Um, and of course, this can get cleared out any time. It's not really kind of durable in the way that you want to put your data there, you know it's there. Um, the next one of the other problems that we have. Uh, with offline is that actually um, offline is not really the problem because offline is the default. You know, when you get your phone, it's offline. When you know, when you put it in flight mode, you, you know, it's offline. But and you know, when you've got no Wi-Fi, the probability is you're you're offline. Um, really, the problem is online because we don't actually know when we're offline. Offline is, is um, sorry, online is a very difficult thing to define. Um, for the, the the classic example is the airport or the hotel Wi-Fi, or even if you go to Starbucks. You're hitting a web page because it's intercepting your um, your traffic and getting you to log in, and then you, you know it's kind of a fake BT open zone thing, whatever it is. Um, but is you know is that offline? Some requests will start being made before they intercept it, and so you, you can't do a thing, for example, like pinging your server because you may actually get a response and say, oh look great, I'm online, without looking at actually what you got back, and what you got back was 
some Starbucks you know, craft and you're not online, but you thought you were. Um, and another, another classic example, I have this every day because um, I commute up from here to, to London, uh, it's on the tube. Um, for some reason, they put, well, I don't know, I didn't see any fanfare about it, but there's, there's Wi-Fi in the tube. But the Wi-Fi in the tube is only in the stations, and it takes the time, at, at, at peak hours, it takes the time between the trains to get on the Wi-Fi, because you have to, you know, pick which provider you've got, so it's, you know, Virgin, type in the username and password, which you've probably forgotten, um, and then the trains come, and you're on the train, and you're in the time, there's no Wi-Fi. I mean, I, I do not understand why they put Wi-Fi. Who thought, yeah, this is, this is such a good layer? I, I know this. I, I, it. And they, they probably sold it to advertisers saying, you know, we can stick some ads in there, but nobody will get to the ads because nobody can ever log in. Yeah. Um, the end result of which uh, is people have been talking about um, this uh, idea, offline first resource, um, where we have to think about the network as a potentially unavailable resource. So um, like some of the other uh, progressive enhancement techniques, um, or techniques, the progressive enhancement ideas like, you know, what, what do we do if we you know, don't have Flexbox, so you fall back to a different uh, solution, or um, you don't have local storage, so um, uh, you don't use it and you find some other way, or you don't have geolocation or anything like that. We now have to maybe have to treat the network as one of these things where we um, you know, progressively enhance up from. Our baseline is no network, um, which is you know, a, a kind of almost revolutionary idea for, for the web, or at least the way we've been building apps recently. I mean, I don't know too many apps, um, web applications where if you arrived and you know, all were built from the perspective of let's imagine they've got no network. Most things are built assuming that the network's going to work perfectly for you over time, um, which just doesn't work, uh, especially on mobile. I want to um, mention Hoodie uh, quickly because I think these guys have been doing are really great stuff. Um, if you've not looked at Hoodie, that's the domain name Hoodie. Um, they are doing some really great stuff and talking about this stuff, which I think is really important. Um, if you go to offlinefirst.org, uh, they are sort of treating that as like a hub to do some research around this stuff. And, and some of the, the problems are in terms of user experience as well as just technical. And what does it mean uh, to, uh, for a user if you make a change but it doesn't get immediately sent to the network? If you're, if you're offline and somebody sends a tweet, uh, you want to be able to handle that and say, yes, we'll send your tweet, but we will send it. It hasn't just been sent. How do we inform the user of that, that fact to make them feel comfortable with the fact that their data is not necessarily being transferred or the action that they're taking is not necessarily being actually taken at the point where they um, make that change. Um, Hoodie, has some, Hoodie has some issues. Their, their thing is essentially you can uh, know there's a kind of no backend framework. So you can build uh, an application without a backend. It's kind of a combination of, of a front end um, uh, Library and uh, and a backend that uses CouchDB, but that can sort of be swapped swapped out. Um, and they make it really easy to to uh, uh, kind of have your data model on the client, so you can um, make changes to that and you know sign up for things and and log in users and do all these accounts. And it syncs the data on the client side up to um, up to the server, and you don't have to worry about that happening. You just do your manipulations on the client side. Um, but there are some some problems with Hoodie. One of them is they don't have any opinion at the moment and actually can't really do anything about um, initial load and delivery of, of, um, uh, of the assets that make up your, your hoodie app. Um, I mean, obviously, we're always going to have the problem of the first time you load a site, you need a network connection. But after that um, comes the problem, because if you, if, you know, if you had it open in Safari and you ref refresh the page or navigate and you haven't got a network connection, that's when you lose it. Um, and Hoodie right now has no opinion uh, on that or uh, hasn't put any work into really solving that problem. Obviously, the same space limitations are there. Um, it uses index DB, um, but it's got those the same limitations. And the binary data situation again is not great. Um, it wouldn't be suitable right now for a, for a video app, for example. So all of these problems and all of these sort of cul-de-sacs of, of uh, technology bring us to um, a new thing: the service worker, uh, which is the bulk of my talk. Um, the idea with the service worker is that it lets us handle resource requests. Um, and uh, add these to a durable cache. Um, durable cache means it's there, and once you know it's there, it's there, it's going to stay there, you're not going to lose it. You may not be able to put anything in there, but you'll never be in a situation where you think you put it in there and it turns out it's not, um, or you lose it halfway through. It's, um, it's there and you've, you've got it. Um, this was originally called navigation controller, so if you've heard, um, heard of that before, then uh, that's 
the new, um, less specific, I don't know, don't know how I feel about the name, but it, um, the deeper you get into it, it kind of makes sense, but service work is not very catchy. Um, and it's sort of built around this idea, um, this pattern that keeps recurring in web applications of, of a shell and some, some content. So the, you know, the Langley app, um, there's some kind of shell that delivers the UI, you know, the search and the um, and all this kind of stuff, you know, logo and uh, different uh, interface elements, and some kind of loading, uh, content loading logic. But then the content that gets loaded in, the events, um, the speaker information, all this kind of stuff, is, uh, is just content. And those two things are kind of separate, and the content is swappable. Um, and you don't really know what the user's going to want to view, but you do know how they're going to view it, which is your shell. Um, and so one way to think about um, service worker is in terms of this um, shell content thing. It, it, I think it, can be, it will be really good um, for applications that need that kind of um, thing, but obviously it's not, um, uh, not limited to that. So just um, a quick reminder, just in case anyone has forgotten how um, browsers work. The, um, obviously, you know, if it's unpaid for making a request to a browser, goes through the HTTP cache, which is kind of important here because it's one bit of caching that we have right now, and then it goes off, um, goes off to the network. Um, the app cache steps in, and, you, and this diagram is sort of intended to indicate where we have a problem. So we don't really have any control over the interaction between app cache, the page, and the browser. The browser can programmatically access the app cache, and we make some declarative statements about what we want the app cache to do, but we have no direct access to the app cache, um, and uh, along with uh, the re related problems. But it's this, um, what one of the th problems we have is there's no direct program access, programmatic access to the, the app cache, and um, the browser exerts a lot of that, uh, a lot of control over the app cache where we have none. The service worker, um, and also these diagrams are very kind of heuristic, basically. Um, uh, sort of, I, I think of as being some, something like this. It sits in between the page and the browser's network stack. So the browser network stack would essentially consist of its HTTP cache and then some way of going to the network on a mobile. You know, on a mobile, that's the radio or Wi-Fi, whatever. Um, it has access to the network events from a particular domain. So you register a service worker for your uh, your site and the domain you're on, um, and the service worker will have access to network requests that your page makes to that domain. If your page goes to a different domain, obviously we can't do anything um, about that as far as I know. Um, but um, on your domain, you have access to the, um, the network events and access to uh, caches. So you can pr programmatically create caches, um, grab content, hold them in those caches and be sure that they'll be there. And this works kind of like uh, a shared worker or a the background page in, a, in a, an extension, if you've ever um, messed with those before. So multiple pages are all talking to the same service worker, which is talking to the same caches. Um, that's just you know, kind of a piece of information, there isn't one uh, per, per page. So um, just a reminder that, that there aren't really implementations for this at the moment. This is the spec as it is in development um, on GitHub, and I've got a link to it later on. Um, so this is how you a pattern for registering a service worker. So the, the first argument is the set of URLs that this service worker should be matched against. So in this case, it's all, all URLs. And the second argument is the location of the service worker. Um, the, uh, yeah, so that, that's the registration pattern. There's also two callbacks. Um, and I put this possibly in terms of prompts which are coming to browsers. Um, uh, shortly, and then and you can you know respond to the fact that the either the service worker registration failed um, or was successful, and make some changes from your page based on that. Um, another really useful pattern in uh, service worker is creating a cache or populate or pre-populating a cache. So this uh, very simply just sets up a cache. What will happen is you uh, call this; it will go off, fetch this data, and come back, and you can um, essentially wait on uh, that cache being filled. So you can. That means you can respond to the cache failing. So if one, any one of these resources fails, then the entire cache fails. So you can group these resources together and say, these are really important for my application. I need the shell, I need the CSS, and I need this JavaScript, otherwise my app doesn't work. And then you can, you can rely on those being there and um, uh, always deliver that subset of your app when you're offline. Um, <clears throat> this is the uh, service worker intercepting um, requests. So 
uh, it can listen for events. One of the one of those events is the fetch event, and <clears throat> it can respond to that event by matching the URL, by for example matching the URL of the request to its cache. Um, so yeah, quite simply, this cache is matched. So that, this cache is, is um, a set of all the caches that you've set up. So you can have multiple caches. You can choose to only hit a subset of those caches. Um, but this this of caches will match all caches. Uh, and then you call event.respond with. And so caches.match returns a promise, which when resolved, um, uh, the service worker will respond. So this will would intercept uh, a request for a CSS file coming from a link tag in the page um, with a, ca a cache value if the URL match. So um, we registered um, assets at one CSS. So if, if the page requested that, it would hit the service worker, hit the cache, the, the cache would match, respond with the CSS file, which would then get sent back down to the page, no network request required. Um, this is possible with um, app cache right now, but it just hints at, you know, you can sort of just get a hint of some of the power um, that's going to be available. And then um, for the kind of shell um, uh, and surrounding assets example, this, this pattern um, may turn out to be really useful. So event dot, the, uh, the fetch event essentially has two types, a uh, fetch type and a navigate type. And navigate is, as it sounds, whenever there's a navigation, which includes in iframe. So if the user um, clicks a link that will take them to a different um, uh, page on your domain, then your service worker will get a, a fetch event with a type of navigate. And you can respond to this in a different way. So in this case, I'm responding to all navigation events with my shell. And I know that the shell only relies on the assets I've uh, actually cached. So um, uh, essentially what this does is it, uh, it will try and um, match the, the, well initially it will go to match the URL, but if it's a navigate, it will just force it to be the shell. And then it will go to do the same um, dance with the cache and the uh, event responding. Um, if the cache misses, uh, by the way, then it will just fall back to the network uh, automatically. So as I said, um, uh, that's just a, a flavor of some, or a taste of some uh, service work stuff. There aren't any implementations right now. Um, and the spec, although there was a partial, I believe there was a partial one of an earlier spec, but um, not, not publicly available. But the spec is, and um, I would I'd recommend going to this site because there is a fantastic set of documentation. Um, there's an explainer document that will take you through way more than I'm saying in, uh, in this talk, uh, plus advanced topic stuff, uh, a, uh, talking about why app cache is a problem, um, all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, again, it's a, a resource I relied on heavily for this talk. Um, the people working on it are um, Alex Russell and, and Jake from Google, and a couple of Mozillans as far as I can tell. Um, and, and one or two others from the community, um, which uh, there's two really interesting things about that. Firstly, that the spec's been worked on entirely on GitHub, and it gives, I, I find mailing lists very alienating, but GitHub is very familiar and friendly, and so I think this is a really good place where um, everyone can, or not, in any, as many people as possible who are interested can get involved and get working on making service worker, firstly, an amazing spec, but secondly, everywhere because obviously we need, we need it to be implemented before it's um, uh, really useful. Although, of course, we don't want people relying entirely on service worker, but we, it would be really nice to get implementations, particularly on mobile, and we all know who the big company who drags their feet on mobile are. Um, so, I said there weren't any implementations, but I have put some work in over the weekend and the last couple of nights, um, and I've got some demos. Um, this is me right now. Um, <laughs> this, this, this stuff is like, I, you know, I've been working on this today. It's hacky as you could want it to be, but um, I'm hoping it'll come up all right. And I just want to show you kind of some some um, uh, some of the kind of things you can do with uh, service workers. Wow, that's gone. Well. Uh, should be able to handle 1280, hopefully. Okay, yeah. well, I'll go with that and then zoom in there. Okay, cool. Right, let's give this a try. Uh, right, so where are I? So, um, I've got a 
uh, demo setup. Let me just check I've got it. Right. So um, this is um, an example site. Uh, Home page, uh, it's just got a normal index page. This it seems to be a bit breezy, so I'm not going to worry about it. Um, so uh, just ignore that web socket that's loading and loading and loading. Um, Home page, it's got uh, some CSS uh, assets and then some JavaScript assets. Um, and what we'd like to do is instead of delivering this home page, which uh, comes from the network, we'd like to deliver it from, um, uh, we'd like to deliver our shell from which we can serve some content. So, let me, I've just got a little bit of setup to do. Uh, so, um, first thing I'm going to do, um, I think I've got a proxy fired up. So, right now, all my web traffic is going through um, an HTTP proxy. And what I'm going to do is start up a, a um, command. So um, essentially this is running the worker in a node process. So what I'm doing is routing all traffic that comes out of the browser to my server that's running a worker um, and back, if, if the worker intercepts it, back immediately down to the browser. Otherwise I'm letting it go through to what it would have gone to, um, which is demo site origin. So this is a bit hacky and doesn't quite um, replicate the, the spec because right now I can't do two things on the same host, but um, it gives you a kind of idea because the origin site is completely invisible. So if I start up this worker, hello, um, uh, currently there's nothing in the worker, so let me just go and show you okay. the worker. Uh, so this is our worker right now, there's nothing in there. Um, so it defaults to um, worker version zero, and just the, the, the WS connection is a, is a web socket that's um, helping me figure out when there are navigations and when there are fetches. So um, now if I refresh this, we get exactly the same thing. Um, uh, the same content, we get the same assets, we get the same JavaScript. The first thing I want to do is make the worker um, log all requests that come through it. So I'm just going to give it a version first. Um, and then um, say, let's start on uh, fetch. I'm going to add a this one. So we get our fetch event, and then I'm going to do uh, event.url. So this should give us um, the, all the fetch events that come through the worker. So just to check it's reloaded. So we've the work file's changed, and I've installed version 1. So now, uh, if I refresh, yeah, why is nothing happening? Not Can anyone spot any problem there? Did you start the proxy? Ah, thank you, Andy. I possibly did. Ah, I know what I've done. I'm not put. See, I did. I, I primed Andy earlier to tell me about proxies. There we are. The proxy was not running. Right. Let's try this again. Part two. So now I have my traffic going through the proxy, and we should get a log. So um, this this request log is coming from um, my server, but this uh, line here. And so now we get the URL that was logged. So you can see it's requesting the, um, the home page just at forward slash, uh, requesting the, that asset and requesting the uh, JavaScript asset. So the requests are now running through the worker. Um, now I'm going to set up a cache so that our assets actually come from the cache. So there's another event, uh, which is the install event. Uh, and this again takes event. And I'm going to populate um, our caches. So I'm just going to save the caches up here. So um, create a new cache. And the resources that I want from this cache are um, the uh, CSS files, so that's assets uh, app. Is it app.1 or app.3? App I can see I've been messing with this, which is why it's version 3. Um, and the JavaScript. And I also want, um, in here, I want my shell, which I'm going to serve later on uh, for navigation events. So, shell. Oh, man, live coding is tricky. Um, then I'm going to do caches.add. I'm going to call it my app cache, although it's not the app cache. 
And then, um, because I want to, before my service worker gets any requests, I want to know that my cache is ready, which is one of the really important properties of, of um, service workers, knowing that your cache is there. Um, I can ask the uh, install event for the, uh, the browser, although in this case it's a node server, um, to, um, to wait for the um, caches to be ready before installing my worker and letting it intercept requests. So um, I'm going to wait for uh, caches.ready. So caches ready returns a promise that resolves when all my caches are populated. Um, and then the worker will be installed. So we should be able to see um, uh, right now that it's now not working. Let's try again. So I've got a problem here. So that you can see it says it's installing, but it's not. Um, it's uh, in the, in the yeah. actual idea, it's, it's waiting until. Ah, but I don't know if you missing a semicolon. Am I missing a semicolon? Now I've got some. Uh, Cache is not ready. Yeah. No, that was a nice semicolon. Uh, no, because yeah, that's inside. Uh, cash. Cash. Uh, oh, hang on. There we go. Yeah. So now we've got that installed. Um, yeah. This API is still. Uh, well, anyway, that's the correct API. But, uh, I've got it. So now we've got version two um, installed, and we should find when we refresh that these assets. Um, You're not handling it in the fetch event. Oh, yeah, of course. So, right. <laughs> nice that someone knows this way. <laughs> so, someone knows my demo. So, um, yeah, in the fetch event, we want to hit the cache. So, I'm going to say um, event.respond uh, with, and then hit my, match my cache. So, um, uh, nope, caches.match event. So that's going to match the, uh, the requested URL, which in some let's say it's slash assets slash app.3.css, and it will look in the cache, otherwise it will hit the network. Uh, let's give this version 4, uh, 3, so next change. Uh, Sorting version 3. And now the assets have come from the cache. Um, and it should. Uh, I've turned some of the logging off, but it, I can tell on some logging that um, says that it's coming from the cache. So now we've got um, these assets coming uh, from the cache. I'm gonna, uh, I, I can turn the origin page off. Um, and I'm gonna try that and just see what happens. So what I'm gonna do is jump in here. So there. Um, no, this. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm turning off the, the DNS to this site. So now the, the, my machine will not be able to find uh, demo site origin, which is the site that the, all these requests are, if we hit the network going to. So you can think of demo site origin as being on another, on another machine somewhere. So um, now when I refresh, we get 404 not found from the root page because that's not cached, so it's being passed straight through. Um, but if I go to assets at 3 CSS, we get the CSS file because it is in the cache. Cool, I've not tried that one before, so I'm not that worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was, uh, is that the right one? Uh, that looks right to me. Okay, so now I go back. So now we get the right one. So now let's try and serve the shell, and then I'm going to, well, I might just, I'm going to never see. If you want to try some stuff, we can try it, but I don't know if my heart can take any more. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> so we want to respond with shell. So I'm going to say if the event um, type was uh, navigate event, then I'm going to force us to respond with um, the uh, URL for the shell, which is uh, as Not dot. Yeah, ah, yeah, right. Thank you. Um, shell dot. Um, no, that's got to be uh, dot, no, cache is not match. Live code review. So, <laughs> this should, this, what this should do is any navigation events that we get should um, be picked up by this if 
and we should immediately um, ping back. Now just to, to show that this is happening, I'm going to just show you some of the promise stuff. So um, promises are coming um, to the browser. Uh, there's an article being worked on, there's a polyfill being worked on, uh, the specs are talking about them. They're actually coming to JavaScript, not um, uh, not necessarily the, the, they're not like a Brett Dom API, they're a, um, they're a JavaScript thing. That'd be really cool, but I, I'm sort of just getting used to them myself. I haven't really been using them on more diehard callbacks, but um, they're actually really nice for doing stuff like this. So in here, I'm just gonna say, after our cache is matched, I'm gonna get back uh, some response. I'm just going to check to see what that response was. So um, we that will just log whatever we got back from the cache. Um, and just to give you an idea of what that object is, and then I'm just going to return that response so that uh, keeps going. Um, and then also I'm just going to jump in here, and this is the failure callback. So um, uh, let's say, uh, let's do something like uh, cache fail or cache miss, and then stick in why that missed. Um, and then I'm going to throw the Y again so that that, that failure is carried down the, the, uh, the promises. So it resolves to a failure, so we hit the network. Um, so let's give this a try. A first page, and we now have the shell, which is the contents of this file here. So there's the shell, shell, shell is working offline, um, and the JavaScript running. And you can see also that this, app, this uh, shell is requesting an asset that doesn't exist, which is 404. So it's missed the cache, and it's missed uh, the network on the other end. And that 404 has been carried back through the worker to, to the page. So to the, to the user, they didn't really you know, need to care that there was a service worker in the way. The things that were there, were there, the things that weren't there, uh, were missed. And you, you just have to make sure with the design of your service worker that um, uh, the assets that you need to deliver the content are there. Um, so yeah, there's that uh, asset being Requested. I can't think. Uh, let's okay. Let's do a cache miss and just see what happens. Um, this could completely uh, explode. In fact, I'm just going to copy this cache fail over to this other one because this is we've already got a failure in the case here. Um, so, uh, in fact, before we do that, let's just inspect the uh, response. So, um, this is the response we got back from cache. So, when when the browser hit slash. Um, uh, this is a response that got back from the cache. So you can see it's it's very much like a request object. If you've used Node HTTP before or anything like that, it's um, sorry, not request response object. It's very much like that. We have a status code, we have a method, we have the headers that came back um, and the body of that um, that response. Um, and you notice there's no URL here because we can map this response to any URL, which is actually what's going on. Um, again, I'm going to try something I haven't tried before. Cool. You, um, in, in your in your actual app, you've still uh, you've got an extra period, by the way, um, yeah. up in second line twenty two, behind shell. Oh yeah. Uh, oh. oh yeah, you're missing that version. Then. Oh, cool. Oh, okay. So let's just jump to version four. Um, version versioning is something that's really important for app cache and will be for this too to make sure that you can bust the browser's cache. Um, uh, so what did I actually just demo? We tried, yeah, so it um, doesn't exist. This got moved, passed on to the, the network, but um, we can see here that we got a cache miss. Now there's, uh, that looks like that came back. Okay, so yeah, the cache miss assets does not exist. Um, so we missed, missed the cache there, which means we can pick up cache misses and uh, something which I haven't um, built yet, but will be possible, will be to post message from the service worker back to your original page. So you can say to the user, sorry, you know, we've got a network right now for this request, but I can offer you these 10 videos that you had previously cached. Mm -hmm. um, and the reverse is true. So it, you, we, you, it would be possible to present the UI to the user that says, pick some videos to, to work offline. Um, you post message back to your service worker and say, cache this video for me and tell me if you succeed or fail, because we want to be sure that it's there. Um, the failure cases, uh, no network, out of space, um, and some other possible ones. Um, but we can be sure to say to the user, look, you know, I know you requested that, but we haven't got space for it, or I know you requested that, but we haven't got a network. Or say, yeah, great, that's now available offline, and next time you come back, it will be here, um, which is uh, better than you know, Netflix can do uh, right now. So um, I'm going to stop demoing, um, because I am on the edge of a heart attack, and <laughs> go back to the comforting warm glow of keynote.
can stop mirroring that. <clears throat> um, oh, uh, actually, I'm mentioning this now. So, yeah, there's the end of the demo. Um, <laughs> sweaty palms. But um, this, this stuff is sort of playable with right now. That, that, um, that's, uh, it's, it's not actually available on GitHub at the moment. Well, it actually is on GitHub, but it's private. Um, I'm going to make it public. Uh, I would love people to play with it. I, there's, I've got a massive to-do list of stuff that needs to get implemented from the, the, um, the spec. But um, this means we can play with this stuff now, uh, explore some of the, explore the API. I've you know, spotted a couple of things that I'd like to, to tweak. Um, and um, yeah, I think that would be a really good thing. Um, oh, great, Keen actually restarted my time. I have no idea how long I've been going on. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, tell me when we get to midnight and I'll <laughs> wind down. Um, so yeah, as I said, I, I, um, I, I really would love to see lots of people involved in this. Even if you're not working on this, Directly working on spec, even if you don't want to get into the, you know, the depths of the, the browsers, the, the, the um, you know, the semantics of the, the caching or any of this stuff. Just you know, have a play with it, see what you think, see what kind of things you can build with it, um, uh, or you think it would be possible to build with it, and the spec should go in that direction. Just submit a GitHub issue because the really nice thing is you're not on a mailing list where someone's going to come in and tell you you're. You know, well, someone might do that, but it's not, it's in the you know the loving arms of GitHub. And as I said, work on um, my demo. I've put the URL there, even though it's private. I meant to open, open it up, but Peter Express. And, you know. So I haven't opened it up yet, but I will. Um, and um, you'll be able to get to it. Um, it's sort of documented, though I've been working on it quite, like, as I said, it's very hacky, so I've been going as hard at it as possible. Um, but I'm going to keep working on it because, um, because it's actually kind of fun to play with. Because there's not really many options uh, right now, so hopefully other people will kind of pick this up and, and have a play. Um, and yeah, uh, that's sort of sort of the end. Then. Thanks very much. And if you've got questions, hit me. Mm. Uh, does anyone have a question? Ah, uh, I do for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that looks awesome. What kind of limits will there be in terms of how big your, uh, you know, how big your cache can get? I, I think probably like um, at cache that's going to be up to the, the implementers. I think mm. we're going to have we're going to we'll just have to hope. Well, it might be possible to put in the spec that you know you have to be able to store this, but you know someone's going to come along and say you know well if we want to get this in Opera Mini. Something like that, really but if you want to get to say on you know an opera and all in, on a low powered Android device, you know you just can't have two gig of space. Mm. But the nice thing about the, the caches is you know before you try and request to the cache that nothing went in. You know mm. at the point of saving to the cache mm. that there was some error, rather than when you go and hit and go to the cache having told the user, yeah, we got this video, and then finally actually. Yeah. So, uh, Are you going to be able to uh, query the size of the cache and the size of the cache? Again, I think that that stuff that probably you know needs to go in the spec. I haven't seen that in the spec, but you know that that's the main issue. It's it's deferred to the Quarter API. So, so, so there's a there's a separate spec uh, Quarter API where you can request space for your your domain, which will be shared between well, app cache, this local storage, and, and index DB. And so it is kind of I think it's a promise based API as well. So you would say like I want this much space. And then that would get promised that would either um, resolve, um, you know, succeed or fail, depending on whether you got that space. And, it, and, and the first step would be down to the, the browser, like, yeah, if you're on a, a, a small phone and you ask for five gig, it's just going to say no straight away. <coughs> if, if you ask for a sensible amount, it might send that to the user first, to say, you know, this website would like to store 500 megabytes of data. And then as the user gets to, to say yes or no. Um, so that's how it would be handled. Not, not in this spec, but in the second spec. But I mean, again, that stuff's probably going to be up to the implementers too, because I don't think all, you know, all the specifications that are in use today, where that's supposed to be challenge response, are all are all like that. I mean, it might be one of those things where we just end up with different implementations that we just have to have to deal with. Yeah, if you ask for this, like a couple of meg, well, if on the desktop machine you ask for fifty meg, it might still. 
Yeah. yeah. But it, it's actually interesting that we're going to be, you know, we are on the web. I don't know, some sites have had to deal with it already, but, you know, the point where we're, we're having to say, you know, you're out of, out of space on your disk, or, you know, I can't get any more space. You know, sorry, how, how would you like to deal with this? Which is just something we've never had to, to think about or worry about, uh, really. Uh, yeah, which is, which is going to be interesting and why, you know, play, I think playing with it and trying stuff out and exploring what that means from a user point of view is really important. So, squint at this in the right way, and it looks like the server was on local host. Yes. And indeed, that's exactly how you yes. um, do it. How does it work with um, in core? So, um, <clears throat> I might have to first take this one, but your cache can do the same thing. So, when populating your cache, it can do the same thing, same kind of requests that. Uh, the page can make, but it's limited like, by the course headers and by normally what you can normally do with other people's responses as to how you can manipulate it. So um, uh, I didn't demo it, but um, because you can, in, because you can catch the cache hit case, so you can say, "Oh, we have got hit." You can then manipulate that response and then send it on. The API for doing at least some of that, the headers possibly do it in a body. I'm not. Uh, Whatever it is that the they you currently can't do will again not be possible. So you won't be able to perform arbitrary manipulation on cross-origin requests because that's you know that's a recipe for for disaster. But um, I mean the other thing you can do um, that again I uh, have implemented but I didn't demo is generate your, you know your own responses and you could you know theoretically generate your own cross-origin response. Don't know why you'd want to, but you probably could. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so the, the, the and, and again, if, if it's a request from the browser from the page, it never hits the service worker if it's if it's cross origin because it's just going to a different different domain. But in terms of the cache populating, you can you can go to other origins, cache that information. You just can't min, uh, meddle with it in the same way. Right. So I can't write a page which um, interacts with multiple service workers from multiple different origins. That's um, so. If there were a service worker. I'm not certain about service worker to, to service worker, but if your page requested to a cross-origin um, resource, and that resource had registered or been able to register a service worker for that browser, um, or that user agent, I should say, um, then uh, I, as far as I know, that would go through that domain service worker. No, it would always go through your service worker. I always worker. go through your service worker, even if it was cross-domain. Any any request from your page will go through your service worker, even if it's cross origin. Oh, okay, all right. Sorry. Yeah, we need better documentation for this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some of it's quite. Yeah, it, you know this. Yeah, this. Is, yeah, you, you can actually, um, if your page makes a request to another domain, you can intercept that. You, well, as in, you can tell that request to do something else. You could even ultimately respond from something from a completely different domain. Right. Um, but security is always determined by the thing you responded with, not the request URL. So if, if you have a, a request on your page to something on your domain, like if, someone, if, you, if your page makes an XHR request to something on your domain, you know, something you can usually read, but you intercept that in a service worker and you know, actually respond with something from you know, google.com or, or wherever else, that will, that will work. But it will hit a cause error by the time it gets down to XHR because the request actually came from another. It would be as if it did a redirect off to that other domain. Right. Uh, you know, the, the, the request would be made, but you would not get access to the response. Uh, I'm just thinking about but navigation events, say iframe loaded in page, so google.com, google.com's registered service worker for .com, you load that page in iframe, that is going to hit the Google service worker, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah top level so na navigations are always. Uh, uh, yeah, handled by the service worker in that domain thing. Yeah. So yeah, it's the the, the fetch case, isn't it? Yeah. Anybody else? <coughs> there was there were hands over here somewhere. Yeah. Um, I was at uh, an Angular JS thing the other night. And they said they got three big targets for version two, and 
mobile, offline and modules. And what do you know? Do you know anything about their offline intentions or does anybody know? No, I'm, no, I mean, no, I know, I know more about their modular. Yeah, no, really. um, I mean, it's, it, it is, again, it's going to be interesting for frameworks. Um, one of the things I actually was going to talk about, um, but I was worried I was going to go massively over, was um, the implications for, for frameworks. You know, are we actually going to be writing our own service workers, or are we going to be, you know, is there going to be a backbone service worker module that understands your, um, your site, understands your app, and, and knows how to offline it? Which is a kind of an interesting idea. You just sort of let your framework offline your app for you, maybe, you know, maybe with some some kind of uh, specific interaction. So I imagine Angular doing something, um, something there, or, or possibly Angular going down the same path as Hoodie, which is data syncing um, without. Uh, yeah, so the, yeah, data syncing where network is not necessary, but the, the delivery of assets is a problem that I, I don't know how they'd, they'd get around other than uh, you know writing your app cache for you. Um, right now, and then service work later on. So I, I imagine their offline thing is probably the same as Hoodie, which is you know we'll we'll look after your data because obviously they've got that and um, you know they've got the uh, uh, the HTTP module and uh, re uh, what they call resources. I've done in a while, but you kind of resources for managing data. If you make manipulations to that data, I could see that they could store that you made that change and and then send it on later on. But I, I don't know that they'll be doing anything with asset delivery, which is you know, the problem of service workers. Um, obviously, at the moment, this doesn't work. It hasn't been implemented. Um, and app cache is um, a larger way of at least serving your apps, Chrome or you know, Shell. Um, so it has a concern side. So, would, how easy would it be to implement this on top of app cache? For example. <laughs> so I think that the the answer. The answer for app cache is there are so app cache behavior is a subset of service worker behavior. So in terms of influencing on, on top, if you tried that, you would there would just be avenues you couldn't go down. Um, so I it, think it's, it's a it's a like you know, app cache is how service workers are in kind of thing. It's it's um I, I, it's, it's interesting. I don't know if anyone follows the the mailing lists on kind of this kind of stuff. But then I saw some emails recently about fixing the app cache and you know what can we do for the next one and uh, that's worrying me a little bit. Mm. But um, hopefully people will see the light and realise that um, uh, app, ca app cache is good for a subset of problems but but just not interesting or interesting ones sometimes. I don't know. It's, it's alright, it's useful for some things I guess. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know if I missed it but um, like with with local storage, okay, you've got like a very simple um, key value pair, and you can iterate over the keys and explore what's there. Is it possible <coughs> programmatically to look at the different files that are available in the service worker yes. in the cache? Yes. Rather, so okay. the caches are um, basically yes six maps. Okay. So um, as far as I know from the stuff. Essentially, you can key with pretty much anything and store pretty much anything. Right. Although we might might be restricted to keying with URLs, but but yeah, they the maps implement for each and every and some and all the, the array stuff, and you just get the the key rather than the index. Um, I, I've got a partial implementation of, of one of those in, um, in here. In fact, you, you yeah. might see when I run the the server here. Oh, you can't see this anymore. Uh, let's go. Ooh, come on. I'm going to shortcut. Oh, no, I thought so. Alfred, sorry. Uh, what are we going for? Display. So. so um, yeah. So when I run this, that uh, uses the so n. Uh, where are we? n is is a alias for node. Um, I probably should just run node. Um, but the, the, har the harmony flag uh, gives you the however much of ES6, the c version of V8 that that version of Node is using has. Uh, so there's some bits of map, but the right now map doesn't have for each and every. So um, and because in 
the, the service worker API implementation that I've done, it has to map over the keys to tell whether you, or not your cache is ready. Um, uh, I had to implement some of that, so there's sort of um, partial. In fact, down here you can actually see the files that are. So, so in this file list here, um, uh, anything without an underscore is something that's in the spec, mm -hmm. uh, except for the files down the right hand side, which are which are various different things. But um, anything with an underscore is uh, something I've had to add in to make it happen. And so, if you go to the GitHub, that's what you see. Okay, so follow up question, slightly random. Um, I'm not quite sure how the sandboxing would work, but um, could this work? Like, if someone wants to make say, an extension or something, um, a browser extension, could it run, could it intercept and set up its own service worker so that you could, for example, choose, I want to uh, cache this website myself, even if they have an influence on their stuff? Um, well, I don't know of any any work or thinking in that area, but <laughs> there's no. I mean, browser extensions. Uh, if if you know, if the they can inject that code. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could yeah, do that. Yeah, you could theoretically just... inject the code. I mean, like one of the things I'm doing in order, in order yeah. to make this work is there's a, a dev tools extension. So um, the reason I I was on this page here, I had have to have this open, and the reason why there's a request <coughs> ticking over here. What this is, um, there's a, a DevTools extension that's injecting um, a WebSocket and some extra code into the page that uh, in, pings the service worker server to say the next request you're going to get is a navigate um, because it, because of the before unload event. So it just grabs that, pings the server, says no, you're going to get navigate. So then the server can set the type of the next request to navigate and then reset itself. Um, uh, that yeah, that was a bit faffing, but. Um, that right now, that's, that I, I don't know if there's another way to do it because the DevTools extensions don't give you access to, they only give you access to network events after they've happened or the list of network events that have previously happened. Um, I, I, yeah, I would really like DevTools to get a whole lot more powerful, but I can kind of see why they wouldn't, wouldn't want that to, uh, wouldn't want that to happen. But yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess theoretically, and, and there's all kinds of hackery you can do because, because uh, extensions can inject, oh, you know, Arbitrary code into mm. into the page, so uh, yeah, theoretically. Um, the actually, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That'd be I great. They, I guess they could. Catch them all, zip it up. Yeah, um, I actually tried. What, what I was going to try and demo, but I I would have had to start a couple of months ago working on it. Um, if I wanted to do this, was offline the, the dev doc site that I showed at the beginning. I was trying to see if I could use this this hackery to offline properly offline by dev docs, but. Um, it would have worked if all they did was talk to one subdomain of, of their site, but I didn't have time to figure out how I could do it from multiple subdomains. It's probably possible because this, this uh, the, the proxy has a, basically a text um, set, set of text rules. So you, you you just say like the demo anything to demo site goes gets redirected to the to my server. Um, and th uh, this that's me trying to simulate network failures. Um, so yeah, so it would have been possible to, I don't know if this thing supports star dot, you know, and wildcard domains, but that might have been possible. I, I sort of went there, but it, that, that maybe um, might even be able to do it with this, you know, what happens if I try and offline via my own site right now? That, that's possible. Contribute on GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were chatting before about possibility of people misusing service workers and I was just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Well yeah I mean so reliance on service workers is, is a is a possibility. Um, it would be horrible but you know if the registered service worker in Navigator carry on otherwise sorry you don't get this website. Mm -hmm. uh, it's possible like it's, it's probably it will happen you know mm -hmm. it's possible that someone's going to do it. Um, I, th I know there's been work in the spec to to make that make so you write, doing that would be non idiomatic so you, it's, it's h harder to write code that, that, that relies on service worker than it is to write code that doesn't but I mean this thing is so a so powerful and b sits in a place that we've never had it, been able to run code before hmm. um, that, that it's it's just going to get abused but we just have to hope that the sites you know. Web developers pull through and do it properly. <laughs> but how, if, 
Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Oh, no, that was... Uh, 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 how does it make it uh, non-idiomatic? Well, it, it, it would just... It just should, like... I guess a good, a good API makes it difficult to do bad things with it. Mm. I mean, uh, so it, it, it would... It's good, it would be best for service workers if doing things that made you reliant on it were difficult. Like, um, I don't know... It, well, it thinks it's tricky because it does give you so you know so much power, but you know, it, maybe it should be difficult to, to to fail your site if the cache you know if your cache has failed. Because you could theoretically say, well, if my cache has failed, go back to the site and just stop the person there and say, you sorry, you don't get any content because I can't cache it. Um, I, I I actually think it might just be a thing where we you know just have to spot places where it's where. It, comes up. Um, I can't remember the, the specific case, Jake might be able to remember, but there, there was a case where s there was something came up and you know, it was like, we don't want to do that because that makes reliance mm -hmm. too easy. I'm like, Jake, can you, can you remember? There, there was a, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not even quite sure what you're on about, but it, it, there was a, <laughs> head of, sorry for me like that, something, but, yeah, there was, <laughs> no, there was a, there was discussion around a header to uh, pre-set up the uh, service worker before it would even satisfy the first request. Oh yeah, that's is that something it? I forgot to mention. Uh -huh. um, anyway, sorry, go on. But that's oh, yeah, but we, we threw that idea out for that reason. That you, 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 we want people to get first requests without having to cache a lot of stuff, and that will also encourage people to build stuff that doesn't depend on the, yeah. on the service worker. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the thing I forgot to mention is your service worker. When you register it, it doesn't get control over that document until the document until you get a new document, basically. So. Um, Ah. The first world, yeah, first world service workers is don't talk about service workers. The second one is um, uh, documents live out their life with the service worker they registered with. So if there's no service worker, that's no service worker. But <laughs> there's a big thread on this GitHub at the moment that talks about um, uh, picking up them, picking them straight up. So you'd be able to. I think that this, uh, the solution they come up with is inlining. Um, uh, inlining service workers and giving you access to the to the page as soon as the <coughs> workers registered. I haven't seen Alex uh, or Jake in that app, and, and the, the other chap who's been really active, um, uh, Anna Van Kestren, or Anna Van Kestren, is that how you say that? Yeah. yeah. Um, has said one thing on it, and so it, you know they've they've made a decision, but nobody who has push access to the <laughs> repo has agreed it. So I, mean, I don't know what's going to happen there. But that'd be interesting. Um, yeah, I think if we did follow that up, it would be the the, the head of method because it. The, the, the alternative thing that some people might do is, is as you say, if this, you know, because you can tell if the page is under control of the service worker or not, and they could just say if that's false, show a spinner, mm. and then the service <coughs> worker will manage to reload the page once it's under control, which is, you know, yeah. not great, but, mm. but yeah, at least you have to jump through some hoops in order to do the bad thing. Mm. I like your, uh, your issue comparing URLs to Zeek. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is actually a bit of a Yeah, there's... Um, yeah, there's there's a whole heap of the API in here that I haven't implemented. I haven't, haven't shown you like a URL type and stuff, which I think is um, is that a different spec? Is the URL URL type is is in a different spec? It's like a URL spec. Yeah, and that's, 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 that's in the browser now. Well, it's in Canary. It's in Firefox as well. Yeah. Oh. Um, I think Firefox have just moved their um, like Windows up location to use that. Um, which is great. So yeah, the, the, I mean, this whole spec is still in development. So I mean, this. This like had no proxy is absolutely amazing, and it's a way to have people be able to play with the API now, because this is like what we need. We need people to sort of be playing around with it and see which bits don't work, because mm. uh, we can change it. Andy, how early does it, or how early can you register a worker in the page before um, <coughs> a pre-parser starts requesting HTML pre-parser? No, it's JavaScript execution. It's, it's a JavaScript call. So how does that work in regard to Tom's really simple page that just had? Oh um, yeah, so with CSS. So yeah, well, I mean, one of the limitations of, of this right now, and I'd love someone else to contribute this back, is there's no. I, I didn't implement registration, um, so it's as if the service worker has already been registered, and you refresh and you just get it going through the service worker. Um, but the, the effect is the, the effect if if done properly is that you only get the service worker on the second set. Um, that's, actually, that's not, it's not, 
So, and I think that one of the things I didn't talk about is the upgrade step of a of a um, of a service worker. So, if you know the, the, the browser detects that there's a new service worker, um, then there's a there's a whole there's like an activate event that fires on the um, on the service worker, and that uh, then you can perform upgrades if you need to, and all, you know, this kind of stuff um, for for doing upgrades. But just on that in terms of that first request, you you don't have it uh, initially. Otherwise, I said there's a discussion going on, and they seem to have decided on how to do it. So maybe that's. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. When, when your service worker, like in, like when you register a service worker and it gets all of the caches it feels it, well, you, you told it it needs it to, to to have a request. You can at that point say, "I will take other pages that weren't loaded with me. I'm happy to just step in right now." Although I'm aware that those pages might have loaded with an earlier version, uh, you know, uh, than the caches that I just set up. You know, if you want to step in as soon as possible, that's that's your choice. So yeah, the, the point I've got to in implementing it is on activate fires, it does the proper. Uh, you know, it, it, it activates service workers in the right way, but they can't and um, they can't immediately swap themselves out and stuff like that. So um, if anybody wants to add that, that would be amazing. Um, we're at an hour. Oh. <laughs> cool. Unless unless anyone else has got anything, but if you just grab me in the pub if you're coming. Oh. Yeah, so that, that, you know, people say app cache develops. I mean, is there other stuff people are working on at the same time that kind of would make this out? <clears throat> well, I'm, as I said, I've seen some emails that are talking about what the next app cache thing is. There's, there's lots of talk about manifest at the moment, and and, um, and I, have, I haven't paid too much attention to that, so it sounds like some people are, um, are looking at it. But as far as I know, there's nothing that... There's nothing like this that's saying, you know, what if we let uh, authors jump in and, and set their own requests, which is just a whole you know, new thing, I guess. So I, I'm not sure, actually. I, I don't really know. I think the, the, the premise of this was that, well, the problem with that cache is it, it tried to be the jQuery of offline. It tried to be the shortcuts before we knew the long cuts, and that's why it failed. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this is why we're completely the other way, like a low-level API where it, we might find that for some common things, people are writing a bit too much code, uh, but we'd rather find that out and then introduce a small, a short, a quick, a short API to that mm. than try and get it in advance. I, I can't find this um, this uh, issue that they've been discussing on. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm just, just trying to. Get to Everything that you've talked about so far has been applicable to get requests. How is it? Is it useful for any other other than get? Yeah. Well, I mean, because if you've got no network and you you want to make some changes to your data, then your service worker can jump in and say, "Oh, yeah, hang on, I can look at you know, I'll look after that." Um, the uh, you can look after that, but you can't retry their problem. Yes, you could, you could do. Yeah, so good. That. But that, that is so that is part of it that's not quite spec yet. But the the intention <coughs> is to to be able to like if you post some data, then your service worker will sort of continue that but catch an error, and then maybe just send back to the page um, that that didn't work. But don't worry about it. You know, so you need to get to the user that you know we'll we'll retry later. Um, we want there to be able to way where you would then maybe retry that request in a way that. Just keep retrying this. You don't need to, you know, you tell me in some other way that it worked later on. And it, it, we, want, we want this request to be able to continue to retry, especially on the phone, even when you close the browser. Mm -hmm. right. okay. it, so like, you, you press send on an email, it fails because you're, you're on, on the underground. You yeah. put it in your pocket, and that email still sends. Right. That's, okay. that's, that's, that's one of the goals. Yeah, yeah. And that would be nice when the fire is yeah. Exactly. And, and, that, and that actually hints at the, at the other aspect the fact that it. Could, you know, could exist in the background is pushing back from the server to um, the service worker. There's a, there's a very very early work on a push API going on, um, and I think Apple jumps middle into the middle of it and just shipped push web push notifications for Safari. I haven't seen anyone using that yet. But that would be really interesting. But there's there's stuff going on. The fact that there's you know we have a work a worker that's running there and it already has APIs for talking about requests and responses. Makes it a prime you know, target for any you know a push API, I guess, and and because we can you know there's fetch events, why not push events? Um, 
this, this list for one and you use it. Push E to maximum push, or are you talking about something? I I don't. Uh, push notifications are outside of my knowledge. I don't, I don't, I don't know much about them. Yeah. Should, should we go through pub? I don't know if everyone. I don't know. Who wants to go to the pub? Because <laughs> these are all pub chats we can have, and if people, I don't know, we've been, I've been here for an hour, and I'm, my bum hurts. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's okay. wrap it up. Yeah. Let's hear it for Tom. <laughs>